Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to episode 141 of the Naturally Nourished podcast. Today we're talking about a topic that we really haven't gone into in depth yet, and we couldn't be more excited to have Dr. Ann Shippey joining us as a guest expert. So we'll be talking all about toxicity, which granted we covered that quite a bit, but specifically spending most of our time on mold toxicity. And this is a big one that I think about, you know, living in Houston, especially post Harvey, it's one of the wettest, most humid, stickiest climates. Um, <laughs> lots of homes with water damage, you know, from Harvey prior hurricanes. I've had some mold in my own apartment before. So a big one that's on a lot of our minds for sure. Yes. And me coming to Houston from Seattle, I, I also had quite a wet, <laughs> mucky, yeah. filled climate out in Washington state. So it was a, a double hit. I think I think a good solid 13, 14 years of of, of some level of potential mold distress. And Austin's just a little bit drier, but I, I think it, that today's episode will shine some light on how you can update your environment and your household specifically to be less risk. And uh, I think that one of the aha moments as we are almost approaching episode 150. I know. Woo. Isn't that crazy? Um, yeah, as we're getting deep into all of the topics, because I mean, how many topics are left, Becky? I mean, there's things. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> We're but, not going anywhere. <laughs> but these trends keep overlapping, you know, so we'll be sure to post links to our most popular detox episodes, uh, because some of the things that we go into today, as you'll see, there's a lot of relevance across the board on topics that include microbiome or liver enzyme levels, uh, pathways of of biochemical detoxification. And there's a lot of overlap in Dr. Shippey's interventions, which I think is positive in the sense of maybe, like what we said with the digging deep into SIBO and Candida, maybe you don't have to spend thousands of dollars testing. Maybe you just make your body resilient, right? Maybe you just support your body's detox process. Maybe you just eat clean to nourish your system so that you have the best host defense about whatever you know, curveballs you're thrown. Because as we all know, when we are in, in different working environments, uh, we can be prone or subject to exposure in areas that we may not have control. So I think that the bottom line that you'll hear today is, yes, there are things you can do in your environment. Yes, there are things to look for. We're gonna share awesome filters, but at the end of the day, it comes to supporting the optimal function of your body. Sure. And we don't talk about this in the episode, but I think bar none, the 10 day detox is a really good starting point, whether or not you have known mold exposure or just, you know, are looking to kind of clean things up and, you know, it's something that you and I do at least twice a year, if not more often um, and recommend more often. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think the 10 day yeah. detox yeah, uh, reset, restore, renew. That's what they're called. Reset, restore, renew detox packs. And yes, I take them a couple times a week for certain. Yeah. Uh, and we do that to mitigate our lifestyle. Uh, me being in my mid thirties, thinking sometimes I'm still twenty something. But you know, <laughs> just it goes with the territory. Of, and then our bodies reminding us that we're not. Our- <laughs> and, uh, Yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, I think attended detox is an awesome intervention. And and beyond that, like you said. Even if just some of the symptoms resonate, whether it's chronic fatigue, neurological stuff, supporting your detox process is going to hit a bunch of potential root causes. Maybe it's a volatile chemical, right? Maybe it is a uh, endocrine disrupting compound and it's from your 
plastics or pesticides or perfumes. So I think that there's definitely a wide, a wide brush stroke there. And we'll be sure to list in the show notes our top uh, from the Naturally Nourished Supplement line uh, tools to support your body system in, in the conversation we have today. Yes, will do. All right. Any other updates before we jump into our interview? So coming on the heels is KetoCon. So we are so excited to meet a whole bunch of you guys in the next coming weeks. And I will be speaking on a medical panel on Friday and uh, also doing a keynote lecture on Sunday. So be sure to get the three-day pass because there'll be lots of stuff going on. And um, if you see me and you know who I am, please say hi and give me a hug. It's taken... 12 years of my journey to have anyone recognize me anywhere. So <laughs> I still, it's never annoying. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to be that person that says no pictures. We can take all of the pictures. So it's cool. <laughs> She's not like Beyonce status yet, but you're getting there. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, yes. And then uh, definitely want to announce that the 12 week virtual food is medicine ketosis program launches July 3rd. So that is coming up quickly. If you are thinking about participating, A, if you're listening to the podcast, you should be thinking about participating. And B, if you're listening to the podcast and you haven't participated yet, you're going to love it. (laughs) Um, It's it's so fantastic. 75-minute classes uh, every other week. I teach all of them live. It's very detail-oriented, PowerPoint-based packed with info. Uh, We talk about adrenals. We talk about the HPA access. We talk about leaky gut. We talk about dysbiosis in the microbiome. We talk about mastering your macros and carb cycling and the role of sexual hormones, detoxification, and so much more. It is really functional medicine meets food as medicine solutions using a low-carb, high-fat diet to optimize your body's metabolic outcomes. So check it out. And if you're thinking about signing up, now is the time because we only allow in 150 members. And once KetoCon hits, which is the last week of June, it's going to definitely be sold out by the end of that weekend. So be sure to jump on that if you're not attending KetoCon, that you get your spot in our virtual food as medicine ketosis program. Yes. And last thing I was going to say, aren't we doing a meetup during KetoCon? Should we tell them about that? Yeah. Yes. Let's do that. <laughs> I think we're doing a meetup on Sunday morning, correct? If I'm wrong, at 8 a.m. at the picnic trailer on South, on Lamar. South Lamar. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so come by and meet Allie, grab a copy. I think we'll bring a little stack of anti-anxiety diet books, or if you have a copy, she'd be happy to sign it, grab a picture and just come hang out with us. And, you know, nothing formal, but drop in for a fatty coffee or a matcha before you head on over to the conference. Mug of bone broth, all the things. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Good job, Becky. So let's uh, go in. I'll read uh, Dr. Shippy's bio and then we'll, we'll bring her on to the show. All right. So Anne Shippy MD is on a mission to help create extraordinary wellness by using cutting edge science, testing, and the latest genetic research to find and treat root causes, and not just the symptoms of illness. As a former IBM engineer, Dr. Shippy became frustrated that traditional medicine couldn't find answers to her own health ailments. So she left a decade in engineering to adapt her skill set to the world of medicine. She attended the University of Texas Medical School and has a thriving practice in Austin, Texas. She is on a tireless mission to help people create a world of wellness because every life matters. She is the author of two books, Shippy Paleo Essentials and Mold Toxicity Workbook, Assess Your Environment and Create a Recovery Plan. And she also has a resource that we'll be sharing with you all. We mentioned it a couple times on this show, um, but we always like to give free resources to our audience. And um, it is a guide on her website and shippymd.com backslash mold. Hi, Dr. Shippy. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited for our conversation today. Yes, we are too. too. (laughs) Um, So we're pumped to have you join us for a topic that we haven't really covered in depth, which is mold and mold toxicity. And before we dive in, I just want you to give listeners, we'll already have read your bio and everything, um, but 
let's give listeners a little bit of background of how you got into the healthcare field and what led you specifically down the path of functional medicine, because I know there's a, a cool kind of career story change here. Yeah, I thought I knew exactly how my life was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was a chemical engineer and was um, getting promoted a lot at IBM into management. I was getting to lead these amazing projects with great people to do things like get chlorofluorocarbons out of our manufacturing process years in advance of when it was mandated. Really exciting stuff for me and my chemical engineering brain. But then I went on vacation one year and I came back and it was never the same. My life dramatically changed. I had severe digestive distress and went from doctor to doctor and nobody could really help me figure it out. I was losing weight and having lots of pain and discomfort and um, did a ton of different studies, lots of lab tests and all they could come up with was try to band-aid my symptoms. So then I realized, okay, I've got to take this into my own hands. And it was before the internet. So I had to just read lots of books, try lots of diets, and seek out uh, practitioners that could think outside the box. So I saw a naturopath and a nutritionist and an herbalist, an immunologist who was really doing some leading edge things. Um, pretty much everybody that I could find to get on my team to figure this out because I knew before I went on vacation I was fine and then I wasn't and there had to be an answer. So once I pieced together what I needed to do to heal my body, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to I wanna do medicine differently and woke up one morning and decided to go to medical school. I was really fortunate because having the chemical engineering background, all I had to do is take some biology classes to be able to uh, go back and take the MCAT and, and get into medical school. And while I was in med school, I had a baby and in residency had another baby. So by the time I finished my training, I was really kind of tired and I had these two little ones. So And it wasn't a clear path to me. How do I do medicine the way that I know it could be done differently? I felt like I had a really good foundation to apply it to, but it wasn't clear. So I went into internal medicine for three years, and then I got sick again. I developed um, two pretty severe autoimmune disorders. I had uh, su really substantial symptoms from Sjogren's syndrome, which is a pretty severe dry eye and dry mouth. And then I had antiphospholipid antibodies, which increased your risk for, or increased my risk uh, for having a stroke. So that really got my attention because I went, okay, my body's really out of balance again. And uh, this is scary stuff. And I'm not going to just take the medicines that band-aid my immune system. Uh, so then that was when functional medicine was just getting on the map. And I found another doctor who had done some of the training and realized, okay, this is what I need to be able to do medicine the way that I really know is possible where we're we're looking deeply into the history, the story of what's happened, and using the latest technology and testing to, um, to find the clues as to what's going on, and then still have the intention of finding the most holistic way possible to get the body back into balance. So here I am, where I'm getting to do that every day. And what year was that when you uh, were licensed then? I graduated from med school in 1990 and finished my residency in 2002. Okay, okay. And then was it the Institute of Functional Medicine or uh, what did you do, the advanced training to yeah. approach things in more of an integrative way? So at that time, so that would have been around 2004, 2005, when I got the autoimmune disorders, the Institute for Functional Medicine had one course. Okay. Jeff <laughs> Land like, came out with the word... What? Functional medicine in right. right around that time, right? <laughs> yeah. So they had they had a week long training, and they're like, then they're like, I can remember standing there. They they there were about thirty five of us in a little conference room in Gig Harbor, yeah, Washington, and they're like, okay, you're ready. You can fly. <laughs> what's, what's one, one Where one. where are we flying? <laughs> <laughs> and and truly, like it was the foundation that I needed to be able to apply the principles and then there's a the whole learning curve so yeah as you know now there's a the whole certification program and there's what 
six or seven different um, modules. Courses that you, modules that you can add on to the week-long initial training and then there's an annual conference that uh, they they pick a particular topic to delve deeply into this one is pain and um, there's so much more available to really help um, healthcare practitioners get into the biochemistry and physiology and think deeply about what the root causes are and and mechanism mechanistically what are the levers that we can really help patients truly heal Yes. And so what was the trigger or antecedent did you feel from your first chronic illness or back set? Was it like a gut pathogen or what was the big light switch flip that occurred on the vacation? Yeah. So I think I picked up a parasite. Okay. And then, but then once the parasite was gone, I still had a flared up immune system and leaky gut and nobody was addressing that at the time. So, um, and then I had uh, undiagnosed celiac disease. So this is one of my pet peeves with, um, with allopathic medicine, where the um, you know, family practitioners, uh, internists, and the gastroenterologists want to wait until your gut is totally dead before they diagnose celiac disease. Right. So I didn't, I still had cilia, even though I had a lot of inflammation in my small bowel on biopsy. And I didn't test positive for the antibodies that they had at the time. So they were like, oh, yeah, keep eating gluten. So part of what my journey was was to figure out, oh, I really need to take out every little speck of gluten. I need to take out every speck of dairy. And then I have to be eating a really plant-rich diet and taking supplements to heal my gut. Sure. Um, so that's out there everywhere on the internet now, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't there at the time. And so I got to really learn the power of food and, and supplements and nutrition and, and helping the body to heal from that. And I know in the world of functional medicine, Dr. Shippey, you're really known as a pioneer in the world of mold and mycotoxins. How did you take a turn? And is this a trend that you were seeing in your clinic that was just not being addressed? Or what was the driving force that really put you into that scope, I guess, and, 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 and your, your work and research and, and outcomes? Let's just kind of talk about how you transitioned into that focus. Well, that was my third health crisis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my body's been such a great teacher for me. Yes. How, how the body can truly re completely recover from even pretty serious illnesses. I had gone to a conference, an environmental health conference, about nine years ago that was put on by Bill Ray, who's, who truly was, uh, he just passed away a year ago, um, one of the pioneers in environmental medicine. And he put together a, a three-day conference on, on mold and mycotoxins. And that was the first time it was on my radar at all that mold could be making people sick. And so I had come back to my practice and I had realized that, wow, this was one of the things that I was missing with some of my patients. I, one family in particular, you know, they're, they had hormone disrupted and uh, night sweats, hair falling out, uh, pretty profound fatigue, anxiety, and all of the windows in their two-year-old house had been installed improperly. And so even though they were, you know, new construction should be pretty good, they were, their whole family was getting pretty sick. And um, so I'd had some situations like that, and then it turned out that I had a hidden leak in my house, and then I had, had some water damage in my office building at the time. But I didn't realize it was affecting me because it was all hidden. And I had started, my, my hair was falling out. I was so tired on Monday mornings so that I could hardly get out of bed. I had so much pain in my body that it was really uncomfortable for my kids to hug me. I couldn't wear heels. And my right arm was getting so weak that I would drop glasses and start to pick up my purse and that kind of thing. And even though I'd had that little training in mold, it was so little that I didn't make the connection. Even though that's, you know, I was being the detective doctor for other people, I couldn't see it for myself. So I had a patient come in one day who had been through mold a few years before, and she's like, hmm, I, I can just sense that you're moldy. <laughs> she's like, Interesting. <laughs> I, like, I still, <laughs> I have, I have um, spidey senses when I go into 
into moldy building. She's like, what time do you get off work today? Um, she just cared about me so much. I'd really helped her get over some significant chemical sensitivity. And, and she's like, I'm, I'm going to come to your house. What time are you going to be home? What's your address? And she walked into my house for a few minutes and her mold symptoms really started clearing up. So she's like, don't take your belongings. Get out of here. Don't spend another night here. And I, I trusted her and I was so sick. I just needed to, you know, do what I needed to do to uh, not feel like I was dying. And she was right. I finally on, the, um, at that time, the mold testing was so unclear on what, how to test and what to do. I finally did the right mold test to find the chitomium she thought I had, which is one of the most neurotoxic molds, it makes something called chitoglobosin, which is um, like kryptonite for Superman. It's pretty, pretty severe stuff. Wow. Oh my gosh. So strong personal story kind of in, in your whole evolution. I think so many of us in the functional medicine realm have some personal connection that we, we came here to kind of heal our own bodies and then, you know, get inspired to spread that work. But super interesting that, you know, molds came about in that way too. Um, and you mentioned a lot of the symptoms that you were having in terms of um, fatigue, extreme weakness, and pain. Uh, but let's talk about just primary symptoms that you often see in clients and um, just kind of tip-offs that you see that someone might know that mold is their driver of disease. Yes, because mold makes so many different toxins, the mycotoxins and the MDOCs, they can have a lot of different effects in a lot of different people. So like if you have a family of four, one, only one person might be affected so far, or um, it could be each person has their own uh, particular weak link that the, that the mold's affecting them the most. Uh, so it can be neurological, like um, the, the weakness, like what I had, or even... Uh, autism type symptoms or Alzheimer's or PANS and PANDAS, uh, the neuropsychiatric autoimmune syndromes. It can be uh, psychiatric, so depression, anxiety, OCD are some of the big ones, uh, especially severe anxiety. It's, um, it, 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 the person can have a predisposition to having depression or anxiety, but the mold can, exposure can really flare that up. Uh, some people will just get adult onset asthma. That was actually my fourth, <laughs> my fourth big health crisis in a different um, building a couple of years ago. Started getting asthma for the first time in my life. Then uh, some people will have digestive symptoms, You're feeling nauseated or diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain. Then um, some people, their their skin is like their weak link. So. Things like hives and uh, itching, or even one one particular case was the worst case of psoriasis I have ever seen, which was so exciting to see him completely clear up. Very very awesome. Um, and then uh, hormonal disruption, so things like um, uh, infertility and um, severe PMS and a tendency towards endometriosis. Um, what am I leaving with? Super broad and, and yeah. wide reaching. Mm -hmm. And like you said, even though all members of a household, and that, and that kind of goes in that whole world of, of epigenetics, right? Where we can all be exposed or, or our own unique microbiome or other factors, our, our intake of nutrients or whatnot, how we can all be exposed to the same thing, but it can express in different people in different ways. And a lot of that comes back to that that individuality and can make it very complex uh, when we're looking for diagnosis. Are there particular lab values? Like I'm thinking all of my work with uh, anti-anxiety diet, whatnot, when you were talking about the anxiety, I'm like, oh, I bet just like with dysbiosis, epinephrine is probably elevated with mold toxicity, I would assume. And that might be a driver of why anxiety is, is experienced. Um, do we see GGT to be off? Do we look at ALT? What, what are some of the lab values that you tend to see as an overarching trend um, when we're looking for toxicity? Mold. So yeah, so sometimes we do see an elevated GGT or um, or other you know the other liver enzymes, ASD. 
but it's so nonspecific. It's really hard to say, you know, is it mold or something else? Um, a lot of times the, some of the immune system markers, um, TGF beta one, the sensitivity CRP, um, LPPLA2 can be elevated, but again, very nonspecific. It can be caused by so many different things. Sure. And probably why blood cell count could be off, I'm assuming, right? Yes. In fact, um, the, some of the mycotoxins can suppress the bone marrow uh, production of white blood cells and platelets. So when I see oh. the low white blood cells or platelets, that's another uh, possibility of what's causing that. Um, um, and then there are other hormonal markers that are uh, top. Uh, with the Shoemaker protocols. Uh, again, they're nonspecific, so you can't draw, draw any definite conclusions from them, but a lot of times we see issues with ADH production, MSH, so some of the more intricate hormonal levels are affected. Uh, VIP can be de uh, depleted. Uh, so what I do a lot of times is I'll look for the um, mole DNA and mycotoxins in the environment. And then I'll look for the mycotoxins in the body. None of the tests are 100% um, predictive. So especially if the test is negative, but I still suspect that there's an issue, um, we'll, we'll have to keep digging. You know, Sometimes we'll have to um, have a very intensive inspection to uh, look in wall cavities and that kind of thing for the, for the hidden leaks. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about kind of some of the, the big aha moments of sources of mold. So you mentioned a, a leak in your office and like hidden leaks in walls. Um, what would someone look for in their own home? Is it like a smell of mold or mildew or um, would they need a professional to actually, you know, help them find the mold? And, and what steps would you take once you see a leak or visible mold? It is such a complicated topic, but I'm like, sure uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm cringing thinking every time, you know, every time you see like bubbled paint in your home, uh -huh. that it's some form of water damage. And then I'm especially thinking Becky uh, lives in Houston. So I'm in yep. Austin and um, you know, she was in Houston during Harvey and was oh, that yeah. Harvey that your ceiling was raining? <laughs> the ceiling was raining. We definitely a hundred percent had mold um, and didn't test. We were in a rented apartment. Old, um, old, right? old, like, old, yeah. Oh, and like a landlord who just patched it over. And I was like, we got, we got to get out. And it's interesting. My husband had severe allergies and it's cleared up so much since we moved. I'm like, oh, thank goodness mold. you knew. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have no idea that that's not okay to just patch it up. Yeah. So <laughs> the, if you've had a leak of some kind, you know, toilet overflow, window leak, roof leak, and you didn't get it dried within 24 to 48 hours, it's highly likely that there was some mold growth. So if you're having any symptoms at all, that's something to consider in what you need to do to get better. Or if you're wanting to be really proactive about prevention, uh, it would be really helpful to get an expert who truly gets how impactful mold can be and have that remediated and, or investigated. Um, if you're in a situation like you were where the ceiling was raining, it's really difficult to remediate that thoroughly. Mm -hmm. So I think you made the right decision to, to move, especially since you didn't own it. But a lot of times those, I, I've had a number of patients come in from Houston where they thought they escaped Harvey. They thought everything was okay, but the, you know, these water vapors, the way that houses are built, like it's basically like a piece of plastic, the, the brick and the stucco and the siding, they know, when they build these places, they know some water is going to get in. But then the vapor barrier isn't perfect. So when you have those driving rains, the water finds the path to get through to the, to the drywall. And a lot of times isn't enough to get, make the paint bubble or get wet, but it's enough for the mold to grow and, and um, you know, just use that drywall as mold food. And a lot of times the drywall has already been impregnated with the mold spores, so they don't even have to, you know, they don't have to be a source of them. They're there, they just get watered. Wow. So, um, 
you know, part of where this whole issue needs to go is we need to start building buildings differently so that we're not growing them out of mold food, you know, basically wood and, and drywall are such great resources for mold to grow. And, um, and then just taking the precautions in the meantime, um, you know, buildings really need to be built well, and then we need to be testing our spaces uh, to, to make sure that they're not getting moldy. So a lot of people don't realize that, you know, we've got the mold spores to deal with, which are allergens. They can really flare up the asthma and allergy, but then they're making the two toxins, the mycotoxins and the MDOCs. Um, so it's, it's really a toxic issue, not an allergy issue. And even a lot of physicians don't realize the toxic issue. Wow. And you mentioned testing um, in buildings. I know we've done that like in home inspection. We've bought different homes or whatnot. Is there a particular like panel that you recommend for in-home testing or companies or, you know, what, what do you, it, it's like one of those things, don't ask, don't tell. I think of it at least in my house as I'm sitting recording. I'm <laughs> like, oh my gosh, because the reality is as a homeowner, especially if you've already bought the house, right? To think of that expense of bringing something down to the studs. I mean, is that what remediation looks like? Complete removal of all the it, things? <laughs> it can be. So if you have a really good inspector, they can look for the clues and they can put cameras in the, the wall cavities, but you know, they might notice a little floorboards uh, separating or notice something growing on your air conditioning vent, you know, really go up and look in the attic. Uh, look in detail around the window sills. So somebody really good can often tell where the problem is and then you know get a super good history like did you have the bathroom you know, did the back bathroom leak and there was just um, you know painting over rather than removing. Then there are all kinds of things like dishwashers and uh, uh, washers can be harbors of mold and um, Ducks that aren't caulked properly uh, can let some water in and, and cause big problems. The, the house that I got so sick in, they had a flashing that wasn't done properly on the chimney. So when there were driving rains, water would come in through the chimney, down the walls in the attic, and then through my um, son's bedroom wall and underneath his bed and then down the wall through my bedroom. So, uh, so one of my sons and I were both getting a pretty heavy hit and it was all hidden until we really inspected what was going on in the attic super thoroughly. Oh my goodness. It sounds like there's, so there's some level of home interventions that are easy, daily, cost-effective, like make sure caulking is up to date and no cracking and sealants and things like that. But listeners can kind of be proactive on, on even maintenance mode per se. So we have a, I have a blog that's coming out on Mind Body Green within the next few days, maybe even by the time this is published that we can link to on some preventive things that you can do during the summer. And then um, there's a anchipymd.com slash mold. There's a really good uh, resource for if you want to test on your own, what kind of test kits can you get? Because you really have to get uh, a significant amount of dust and then do a DNA evaluation for the different types of mold and an evaluation for the mycotoxins present to get a, a, a good picture about what's going on with the current, uh, current um, building. Oh, I love that. And we'll definitely be sure to share that with all listeners. So before we go on about supplements and diet intervention for mold detox, as well as drivers of cause in the diet, uh, I want to share a word from today's episode sponsor, Further Food. So today's episode is sponsored by Further Food. They produce products that are the highest quality food as medicine supplements. Their collagen and gelatin is grass-fed, pasture raised, and they also have a wild caught cod collagen. The Further Food community is made up of functional medicine doctors, nutritionists, and health heroes who share their expertise to inspire product formulations that really work. And I myself and Becky in our own household use Further Food products 
pretty much on the daily. <laughs> yes, we do. And we absolutely loved meeting Ashley and her team last year at KetoCon around this time and have been working with them really ever since. But I just love that Further Food is women owned and operated. And each of the three women on the core team actually has their own personal experience with chronic illness, be it IBS, Crohn's, or thyroids. They have experience in this area that you know disproportionately is affecting women. And their vision is to create beyond the amazing products. They create a community-driven, comprehensive online platform where you can go for food-based wellness insights and work to heal your own body. So if you aren't using collagen or gelatin yet, that is a fantastic entry point for restoring gut integrity. In fact, as we get into the hot months of the summer in Austin, Texas, it's already super sticky and really sticky in Houston, I'm sure. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> facts. Uh, you know, you may want to transition from that hot mug of meat juice or bone broth into something like collagen or gelatin and doing fun things like gummies. I just did for Stella's third birthday, a dinosaur dirt cake where I made three different layers of uh, gelatin gummies in dino molds. And it was a big hit with all of the kids. So gummies are a really flexible way to get that therapeutic gut restoration and definitely fun for all seasons. Reasons. And then collagen is super versatile. Um, you can go on my blog and search the word collagen and you'll see things from my collagen zucchini low carb muffins um, to various protein shakes, pancakes. I add it pretty much into any dry nut flour blend and it's a great way to get more nourishing protein into your children as well. Yes. And Further Food also makes some awesome blends that contain adaptogens like their turmeric tonic, which I will often add as a turmeric latte blended with coconut milk um, for a little mid-afternoon snack or their matcha powder, which I'll often do as an iced matcha latte in the hot summer months. And it's really yummy. And they all have adaptogenic herbs that help us to cope with various stressors in our day-to-day -day lives always a good thing. Yes. Uh, so go on over to furtherfood.com and put in the code Allie Miller RD at checkout. That's always wonderful because you let them know that you're listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. But also when you put in Allie Miller RD at checkout, you will save 10% off your order. So go on over to furtherfood.com, check out all of their food as medicine products and use Allie Miller RD at checkout. All right. So back to our episode, let's talk a little bit, Dr. Shippey, about interventions on, um, you know, we've talked about the home and kind of the remediation and, and testing piece. Um, well, can we before I just, just cause this is a burning personal question Yeah, go for it <laughs> um, with the home before I move on to diet and supplements. Uh, is there a particular air filter that you recommend? Oh, good uh, question. Let's say, right, let's say we are renting and the landlord isn't listening and <laughs> you know you can only do so much as far as you can't tear out walls. Uh, are there filters that you like that you think are effective? Yeah, so it depends on how significant the symptoms are and how much of a problem you think you have. Like it, it, there's no air filter that will, uh, regardless of what the filter companies are saying, there's no company that will really make it okay. Um, but to minimize the impact while you're figuring out what's going on, uh, depending on how severe it is, there's a, actually an air scrubber that I like by Dry Ease. It's a big, blue, ugly thing. So <laughs> it's not good for decor, but it can move a high volume of air. You put a charcoal filter in with the HEPA, and it will you know, do a high, high volume. Then uh, beyond that, I really like the IQ error or the Austin error with the charcoal filters. So especially the, the IQ error, uh, that, that one will also take some of the VOCs out. And um, I think probably most people would benefit just from an improved air quality, especially in your bedroom sure. or where you're sleeping at night to get, get as clean of air as possible. Awesome. So I'll put links to both of those products in the show notes as well. Okay, Becky, you rock. Yes. Oh. <laughs> this, really is, this is, there, there are some states that have better legislation than others for, for tenants. Okay. You know, it really is the landlord's responsibility to make sure that they handle mold and air quality appropriately. 
they cannot ignore you. Uh, the patient that I talked about with the severe psoriasis, it was just heartbreaking. He and his children had moved into a rental house and the landlord knew obviously had known that there had been water issues and covered it up. And so he actually did have a, you know, a legal um, stand against him and, um, and they, they were able to get out of their lease and then settle it for some of their, for some of their medical bills. So it really, it depends state by state, city by city, what your uh, legal, legal rights are, but, but don't, do not stay in a house or apartment that you know is, is making you sick. There's got to be a way to, to, to get out of it. Yeah. I think that's really, really good advice. We didn't look into that route of recourse. I was just like, it's moldy. We're out. Yeah, no, <laughs> We're and, done. But I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, I'm not uh, encouraging litigation, but sure. if, you have, yeah. if you have a situation that's egregious like that, um, uh, and, and the thing that would, you know, really upset this particular patient too, is that they, even when, uh, he and his family moved out, they brought another family in with a baby, mm, so right, they, 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 you know, it's just, right. it's just, you know, it's unfathomable that people are that, um, bent on making money and not doing the right thing that they put people at risk like that. Sure, sure. Um, and I think, you know, getting the word out there on the actual dangers to your your body and um, kind of what this can result in is a big part of that, of, of making this a serious issue beyond, you know, the aesthetic of, oh, gross, there's mold on the wall. I don't want to look at it. It's like, <laughs> no, it's, it's well beyond that and way, way, way deeper, clearly. Um, what would you say on, you know, an individual kind of body level, if we have been exposed to mold or um, if we have known mold toxicity, what would be some of your top interventions in terms of supplement strategy or um, any lifestyle detox pieces of the puzzle? Oh, I love that question. And the, the first thing is just to know that you can totally heal. <laughs> Even if you're, you know, you're feeling hopeless and you're like, oh my God, I don't think I can ever get better if you're that sick, right? Uh, the, the number one thing is to minimize additional environmental uh, exposures in general. So get the lowest mold place. Like I'll, I even have some patients that will go stay with friends or family in areas of the country that are less likely to be moldy, like mm -hmm. Colorado. They're, you know, it's not perfect there, but it's just less likely right. um, to give their bodies a little break and give them a jump start. Um, and then other environmental toxins like you know, fragrances and pesticides and that kind of thing can all be contributing to filling up the barrel. So um, trying to minimize those exposures as well. And then foundationally eating a really clean diet. <laughs> and I know you guys talk about that over and over again. So it really does make a huge difference to be eating your cruciferous vegetables and getting lots of phytonutrients from your diet and minimizing the inflammatory foods like sugar, gluten, dairy. And then for some people, grains and, um, you know, really making sure that the body has those signals to, uh, for, from a genetic standpoint to be able to heal. And then the, um, the nutrients that also help to detoxify. So at a minimum, those two things are required to be able to get better. And then there are supplements that can really, really help to, um, what I, think about as being like opening up the spigots to let the toxins out. So one of my favorite things is liposomal glutathione, which we've got one of my, my favorites on the web, the website. Uh, you start out with just a little bit because it's like a series of dams. You don't want to open up one dam and not have the ones downstream uh, working properly and, and kind of flood the system. So starting out with a little bit and then taking things that really support the liver. So um, there are some good things with um, milk thistle and curcumin and, and those kinds of things in it. Uh, magnesium is super important cofactor for a whole lot of enzymes to work properly. And then uh, having the healthiest microbiome possible because that's so important for um, 
toxin uh, elimination and transformation. So a lot of times a probiotic and some of the gut healing things are helpful, uh, especially a low toxicity collagen, like you mentioned in your um, little segue there can be super helpful. And then things that feed mitochondria and rebuild cell membranes. And a lot of this is in the, the mold uh, handout, the AngioBMD uh, slash mold as well. AngioBMD.com slash mold. <laughs> so, um, so there's some forms of CoQ10 and PQQ that I really like for mitochondria. Um, carnitine and deribose, and then things to rebuild cell membranes like phosphatidylcholine can be tremendous uh, because a lot of these mic mycotoxins are direct mitochondrial um, toxins and, and can actually kind of like melt cell membranes, which are so important to be able to have all the signals in the body be working properly. Um, oh, and then, oh, go ahead. Oh no! I just I like I haven't thought of that connection of of the cell membrane playing such a barrier defense, you know, of course, mm -hmm. and then communication and function of the body, sure. Mm -hmm. And then we really want um, you know plenty of water so that your kidneys are being supported. Um, so drinking at least eight cups of super clean water per day, more if you're you're working out, and then some of the things that can really help to open up some of those. Uh, subsequent downstream dams as we're working on getting the toxins out would be um, there's a, a detox bath that I really like, infrared saunas, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be really, really awesome for, for getting those out. And then um, binders. So a lot of um, people that are treating molds use cholestyrene and well call. But my experience with that with myself and with patients is that a lot of times that uh, can make you sicker. Whereas a lot of the more natural binders like clay and charcoal, modified citrus pectin and silica are very gentle. They don't pull out the toxins or uh, the um, minerals as severely um, and they don't deplete the good fats that we need to rebuild cell membranes. And so they're just as effective or more without the downside of some of the medications that are used sometimes for binders. Sure, and well, Cole, I've seen a lot of issues too with the driving hormone really low because of that fat connection. And I don't think that that's as common in the natural binders either. That's exactly what I see. Mm -hmm. And on probiotics, um, can we just unpack that a little bit further? Because I think that that's a mucky world. And I know a lot of listeners probably have confusion of like, yeast overgrowth, candidiasis, morganella species and different maybe gut yeast strains versus inhalants. And then uh, are there any particular, like I think of Saccharomyces boulardii or uh, Lactobacillus planetarium for gut integrity. Are there any particular strains that like need to be in your host defense or your artillery if you, if you know you're dealing with mold as a risk factor? Mm -hmm. So with patients, I really like to do some of the uh, newer... DNA type stool testing so we can actually see where they're deficient and where they have overgrowth and and address that. But you know, general themes that I see is that a lot of times there is some uh, you know small bowel overgrowth going on because of the immunosuppression that happens from the toxins. Mm. Um, so I like to actually do quite a bit with the soil based probiotics. Uh, there's one that I'm loving right now called Terraflora, um, but there are several companies that make those soil-based, and that seems to help the, you know, some of the bacteria that are <laughs> getting to have a party uh, mm -hmm. to, to get into check. I'm not a fan of the Saccharomyces. I see that that um, a lot of times, especially when people's immune systems are suppressed, that the Saccharomyces can actually cause an overgrowth. Hmm. and uh, be, be detrimental. And then um, it can also be an immune system trigger for some of the autoimmune kinds of things that we see happening on a broader scale. So I don't find that I need that. And I um, generally, like a, once in a blue moon, will use it um, because I'm really finding other solutions that work better. And then... Um, 
a lot of times, uh, you know, just having a really good healthy diet with plenty of prebiotics in it um, can be one of the best ways to get the good um, microbiome built back up and then avoiding the, um, the carbs and sugary kinds of things. Sure. Yeah. Any other diet tidbits? You mentioned the cruciferous veggies for supporting detox. You mentioned the probiotic foods um, and collagen. Anything else in that um, kind of diet arsenal to help build the body back up after mold? Um, I, if people will do this, I love it. So trying to get some of those vegetables with every meal. So even having things like a vegetable soup for breakfast or, um, you know, sauteing some vegetables for breakfast, like at every opportunity, getting those vegetables, any type of vegetables in can make a dramatic difference in the, the speed of the recovery and then small amounts of fruit. So definitely when people are exposed to mold, they have a predisposition to be more likely to have a fungal overgrowth. And so even if you are eating a lot of fruit, you can be increasing that, um, that overgrowth. I mean, everybody has a little bit of fungus all the time, so we, it's not something we completely eradicate, but we just don't want to be encouraging the growth. So I'll usually recommend like a half a cup of berries once or twice a day, or just very small amounts of the other, of the other fruit. Most people don't have to go to the extreme of you know, what's considered to be a full mold diet where they can't have any big vinegar or uh, mushrooms or anything um, dried. Um, but it's still good to kind of minimize those things. Like I, I don't think you should be doing a lot of vinegar, kombucha or kavita, thing, those kinds of things. Just very small amounts of... Um, of fermented foods because a lot of times there's a big histamine part of the um, the mold response, and so the high histamine foods can definitely play a role in increasing the inflammation and making it harder to heal. So at least temporarily, avoiding the dried uh, foods and fruits, trying to eat as much fresh as possible, and not. Yeah, and not doing the ferment, many of the fermented foods. There is a sauerkraut, and I can't think of the brand right at the moment. They have it at Whole Foods. It comes in a little tub that seems to do okay for most people. And probably if you are really carefully doing your own kimchi or fermenting things, um, where you are really careful about what you're putting in it and making sure that it's really well washed so that there's not some scragglers having a party later on. <laughs> yes. No, not, not a good kind of party to have. No. <laughs> no, not the kind of party that we want. Exactly. And then I'm thinking if you tolerate, uh, you know, obviously if you're dealing with SIBO, maybe not so much of like the alien family, but otherwise uh, thinking like garlic would be great and uh, onions to give the quercetin and things like that, that would help detox as well as garlic having some of the antifungal stuff and maybe coconut oil for caprylic acid. Exactly. And uh, putting in the lots of spices like the turmeric and ginger yes. can be super helpful. Like, um, you know, making some fresh ginger tea where you chop up the ginger and bring it to a simmer and then drink it. I think that's really, really soothing for the gut and helpful for the immune system. And sometimes I'll get some of the fresh uh, turmeric as well and throw that in. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lemon ginger turmeric shooter and that would work really well, I think, in this case. For sure. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> great way to start the day. Yeah. Um, awesome. This has been super helpful. Is there anything that we haven't asked you, Dr. Shippey, that you think is important for our listeners to know on this topic? Anything to look into, rocks to pick up, or uh, aha moments of discovery? You know, one of the symptoms that I didn't mention early on that I thought I probably should is this easy tendency to get dehydrated. Hmm. Um, I see that over and over again. So, you know, really being intolerant to heat and uh, getting a little bit orthostatic, you know, where you're lying down and going from standing up and you're not feeling right pretty easily, as well as getting muscle cramps, uh, you know, the Charlie horse kind of cramps, and then also having little uh, fasciculations where the muscles are jumping. Mm. That's a huge red flag, as well as just feeling more brain fogged. 
like your, your memory isn't working quite as well, maybe executive function and decision making, I would highly think about it an environmental toxin, especially mold, as being the underlying cause. And, and with all of this, I think the main thing that I really want people to know is that once you identify the problem and you uh, get in a clean environment and get it sucked out of your body, you can feel better than you felt in a long, long time, if not ever, um, by being super pro proactive. Um, I just see people feeling like, oh my gosh, it's, is it worth it to put all this work into this to try to get better because I'm so sick, I don't even know if it's gonna work. And I just want people to know it is so worth it to make the effort and to keep putting together the pieces of the puzzle until you totally recover. Sure. So it can be a, a scary time, but also there's that hope that once you get out of that environment, that things are going to improve, you know, very dramatically, probably pretty quickly um, with some of this additional support. So I think we've given a lot of really good um, tools to our listeners of, of kind of areas to start looking into and, and symptoms to be aware of and kind of go look under your cabinets <laughs> <laughs> All of that. Um, Dr. Shippey, we always ask our, our listeners this last question here. Um, give us your 23, uh, 23, oh my gosh, 24 <laughs> hour recall. There's 24 hours in a day, guys. Don't, don't um, an hour. I know, right? Yeah. Where did that come from? Um, so we want your 24 hour recall. You know, as dietitians, we ask our clients this all the time, but what did you eat yesterday from the time you woke up to the time that you went to bed. Oh, memory. It's a memory it's test. It's a memory test. It's a memory test. <laughs> okay. So I am loving greens or the smoothie box right now. So I'm, my, my favorite breakfast right now is um, it comes all ready for me. And it's got a whole bunch of vegetables, including kale, all frozen. I just have to open it up and throw it in um, a blender with some macadamia nut milk. And then I add some... Um, IgG powder and some cinnamon and some pea protein with a bunch of detox supplements right in it. So I'm starting every day. <laughs> like if I didn't do anything else that day, I've got a really good start. And then I had uh, some leftovers, uh, vegetables, and uh, a protein for lunch. And um, a lot of times if I don't have anything, I have a freezer stocked of Paleo on the go um, because I can take that out and heat that up in a toaster oven pretty quickly and get my cruciferous vegetables and my little bit of protein. And then last night I got to, uh, I got to go to Sway, <laughs> which oh, yeah. is oh, yeah. <laughs> one of my yeah, one of my favorite Thai restaurants that's really great at doing gluten-free, dairy-free. And um, I did a, a curry that had a bunch of vegetables in it. It was a little bit spicy, but it was delicious. And then they did um, these little shrimp um, wrapped in a leaf and some, um, and then a steamed, steamed fish with lemongrass. And that sounds delightful. <laughs> it, was, it was so good. <laughs> oh, and then when I'm, um, if I get a little, where I need a little bit of something between meals, there's a, an organic cashew butter that I love that I'll just go have a spoonful of cashew butter as a, as a quick snack. I oh, love it. Love it. That sounds right up my alley. We could, we could have a dinner date. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> it's um, worth it. I'll come in. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> this has been so much fun, Dr. Shippey. We've really enjoyed having you on the Naturally Nourished podcast and sharing all of your depth of knowledge, so much fun conversation, and, and also I think answers to maybe some uh, questions that people won't even know that they have. So really appreciate having you on the show. Um, if you could just share with listeners where they can find more about your work, like I said, we'll be sure to share links, um, but just let them know how they can engage with you and learn more about you. Oh, I hope they will. Uh, AnnShippyMD.com, and then we're on Instagram and Facebook. And we're putting out information every week that we think will be helpful on this topic of mold and environmental toxicity in general, just um, to make it really practical, not overwhelming, but let's do a little bit each day, each week to dramatically change the trajectory of our health. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you 
for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.